Welcome to the IEPP Web Conference, Small Business Data Breach, Analysis, Prevention, and Public Relations Recovery. My name is Dave Cohen. I am the IEPP's Knowledge Manager, and I'll be your host for today's program. We'll be getting started with the presentation in just a minute, but before we do, a few program details. Participating in today's program will automatically provide IEPP certified privacy professionals who are the named registrants with one CPE credit. Others who are listening in can apply for those credits through an easy to use online form on our website. We also like to remind you that today's program is being recorded and will be provided free to registered attendees following the live event. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during the program by typing them into the Q&A field to the right of your PowerPoint window and your questions will be answered by the presenters at their discretion either during or after the presentation. And now on to our program and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the structure of today's program. We'll begin today's program with a lay of the land for small businesses with respect to data breaches and provide you with some statistics about what is actually happening out there. Uh, we'll then move on to a discussion of the particular unfortunate event that Days Jewelers of Maine and New Hampshire experienced in 2011 and how they successfully handled the fallout from that. Uh, that'll be followed by their lessons learned and some key takeaways from that experience. And we'll then finish up the program with some prevention advice and resources for you to explore further to help you prepare for and deal with uh, breach should that unfortunate experience befall your organization. And so with that, I'd now like to move on and introduce today's panelists. Uh, Jeff Corey is the owner of Dave's Jewelers. And Jeff, would you like to tell us a little bit about your uh, background and professional experience? Yes, uh, sure. Good afternoon. Uh, my wife, brother, and I own Dave's Jewelers, a chain of six retail jewelry stores in Maine and New Hampshire, as, was, as well as an e-commerce website. Our company was founded 100 years ago this year in Portland, Maine. We employ about 150 people. Um, my career in the jewelry business began as a young boy under the tutelage of my mom and dad who owned a small jewelry store in northern Maine. I've always been very passionate about, the, uh, about protecting the integrity of the jewelry business, both in my company as well as um, globally. I've served as president of Maine Jewelers Association as well as uh, on the executive board of Jewelers of America. I currently serve as vice president of uh, Jewelers of America Political Action Committee and also on the board of directors of the national uh, charity Jewelers for Children. And I'm a member of uh, De Beers uh, Forevermark uh, Advisory Council. Uh, and I'm proud to say that Days Jewelers is uh, one of six independent retail jewelers uh, certified by the Responsible Jewelry Council. It's an international organization committed to social, ethical, and environmental responsibility. And our success has always been based on um, the trust of our customer. Well, great. Thanks very much, Jeff. And, and I, I want to say um, uh, from the IPP standpoint, a hearty thank you for being willing to share this experience with others so that they can learn from, from uh, what happens to you guys. Um, and. Uh, Joining Jeff on the panel, Diana Fletcher is the founder and president of Fletcher Media. Diana, do you want to talk a little bit about your role here? Thank you very much, Dave, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Yes, I'm the founder of Fletcher Media, which I launched 10 years ago. Uh, Fletcher Media is a PR firm specialized in crisis communications management, media training, and video production. We have offices in New England and Silicon Valley, and Fletcher Media works with clients globally, including technology, healthcare, and startup clients. Before I founded Fletcher Media, I spent over 15 years as a journalist, and I worked mostly in consumer and investigative reporting, as well as in front of the camera as an anchor. Um, and you can imagine in this crisis communication arena of today, data breach, PR recovery is the fastest growing area of Fletcher Media. Great. Thanks, Diana. And to round out our panel today, Bob Siegel is the founder and CEO of Privacy Ref. And I'd also like to uh, take a moment to thank uh, Bob and Privacy Ref for sponsoring today's program. Bob? Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure to uh, be sponsoring this. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this webinar. Um, I founded Privacy Ref two years ago. Um, and we have offices in uh, Florida as well as in Boston. We focus on helping organizations um, assess and improve their privacy practices um, with a focus um, on small business. So uh, being able to sponsor this webinar is right up our alley. Um, for myself, I am a 
I have several certifications from the IAPP, CIPP US, IT, Canada, as well as the CIPM. And um, yeah, as I said, just uh, glad to join you today. Previous to uh, founding Privacy Rep, I was the um, global um, privacy manager for Staples. Um, so had uh, participation in putting a program together for uh, 66 business units across 28 different countries. Well, thanks very much, Bob. It's a pleasure to have you and uh, everybody on the panel with us today. And with that, let me turn it over to Bob to, uh, to begin today's presentation. Bob? Thanks, Dave. Um, one of the things that, that occurred to me when I was approached by Dave to participate in this panel was to um, try to understand what some of the uh, thinking was around small business and privacy. Um, but the first question I had to ask is, what's a small business? It's difficult to um, define a small business in terms of revenue, because depending upon the industry that you're in, um, a small business may have multi-million dollars worth of revenue or may just have a few hundred thousand. So what I found is that most um, quantifications of a small business occur around the number of employees. The U.S. Small Business Administration, for example, generally says that less than 500 employees constitutes a small business. Well, that, that's fine. Um, but that means that almost 99 or almost 100 percent of all U.S. firms would then be qualified as a small business. There was a second uh, take on it. In 2012, um, Symantec, along with the National Cybersecurity Alliance, did a small business study. And what they defined as a, a small to mid-sized business would be to have 250 employees or less. And um, frankly, in the literature I reviewed, um, it seems that that's probably a better measure to use. And we'll, we'll use a some information from they, their study to talk about some of the things you find in a small business. But the fact of the matter is that all businesses, no matter what size they are, they're subject to the same threats and vulnerabilities. The, the common threats or the classifications of threats are people technology or acts of nature and environmental factors. Um, people, you may have things that are intentional, hackers, for example, or someone breaking into your facility and stealing your laptops, or not the desktops or other computing equipment, or in fact, even stealing your papers. There are, um, of course, unintentional people threats, people intending to do the right things, but inadvertently do something by mistake. Um, for example, they may sell a filing cabinet and not take out any of the papers that are in there. Or one of my favorite stories involves um, the, the uh, celebration the last time the New York Yankees won the World Series and they were coming down the Canyon of Heroes and people opened up the window and threw confetti out as they normally would. But in this case, they threw out full financial reports of people. So down on um, Broadway, you found people's account information, their addresses, and what their holdings were. Um, there also may be just simple emails being misdirected. Again, that's an unintentional, um, you know, unintentional threat from people. Similarly, there are technology threats that are intentional or unintentional. Um, you could have people that are, are, are technology um, malware um, or viruses that are put on your computer, or unintentionally it could be a bug that was put into a program, um, similar to the open SSL situation that occurred several weeks ago. And of course, there's acts of nature. Um, when Hurricane Sandy came in through the Northeast, there was a tremendous amount of personal information that was scattered across the, the countryside. Vulnerabilities, um, again, common across all sorts of businesses, could be um, not managing properly who has access to personal information. Um, could be unsecured communication, sending emails out that aren't encrypted that contain a lot of personal information, for example. Um, there could be unauthorized information access. Um, similar to ineffective access controls, but in this case, it's more of someone actively going after that information, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. And then there's core poor, poor coding and configuration. And in fact, one of the more common ones that I find is just poor security training and privacy training and awareness. Um, again, businesses, regardless of the size, have to deal with all these items. Um, but small businesses have fewer resources to address all of these items. Um, there's always a trade-off when the, 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 the resources that are available as to whether to invest them into revenue-generating opportunities or to invest them in 
um, some infrastructure things and some practices. So from that 2012 National Small Business Study, 60% of small and medium businesses do not have a privacy policy. And that puts the small business at risk because how do the employees know what they should be doing, how they should be treating information, and how important privacy is to their organization? 83% didn't have a cybersecurity plan. So how are employees supposed to act as on the Internet, for example? How are they supposed to protect information within their own computers? 68% um, didn't have security training. Um, 58 did not have a breach response plan, so that when it came time um, in the event of a breach, they were shooting from the hip, and that's probably one of the last times you want to make a mistake. And then finally, 90% of SMBs do not have an internal IT manager. In fact, the study found that in absence of the IT manager, in absence of a, a, a privacy specialist as well, that the owner of the organization stepped up and took on that role. And when that happens, without you know, complex knowledge or detailed knowledge in these areas, it could lead to potential mistakes. But, but having said all that, 83% of small and medium business owners believe that they're making a sufficient investment to protect customer or employee data. And it, it, it's understandable, not so much that all these things are missing, they still believe that they have made a proper investment, it's just a lack of awareness of, of what um, needs to be done. And that's a huge problem. How do you get that message out to small and medium businesses? In addition to all those statistics, I just wanted to step back to mo and, and mention the cost of a data breach. Uh, the most recent uh, Poneman Institute numbers show that overall um, the cost of a data breach is about $136 per record. This factors out large data breaches like we've seen in the recent past to Target and the like. Um, but here in the United States, it's still $188 per record. Um, not the, the most expensive in the world, but certainly right near the top. If you can imagine a small or mid-sized business losing the records of about 1,000 customers, you now have a $200,000 hit roughly on that business, something that can put the business underwater right away. So when I, I was at a networking event this morning and mentioned those numbers to someone, and I quickly got asked um, their attention and asked to come into their organization to talk about data breach and data protection a little bit. So do small and mid-sized business needs to worry? Absolutely. Nearly half the data breaches that Verizon found in their 2012 report took place in companies with less than 1,000 people. According to Semantic, 31% of all attacks that occurred in 2012 happened to businesses with less than 250 people. And finally, just when you think about virus protection and information that's kept on your laptop, a company called iScan said, found that the average desktop that they monitor has 210 vulnerabilities. And of the information contained on those uh, computers, 96% of them had sensitive information. So there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of potential to lose it, a lot of potential to have it taken. And I just wanted to lay that as the foundation as we move into the talk of what happened at Days Jewelers. So Diana, I'll turn it over to you to provide some uh, more information about that. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, some eye-opening numbers there um, with regards to small businesses. And if you look at those figures that, that you provided, Bob, I think that everyone is probably hit by the fact that small businesses are often blindsided and are often ill-equipped to handle what could be a devastating, not only financial setback, as you mentioned, but looking at the cost per case, but um, from the vantage point of the long-term PR effects of a data breach. As we look at you know, what, what you said, a lot of people may think that they have um, the proper um, compliance or the proper training, but oftentimes that's not the case. So what we're going to do today is really look at uh, one case study, our case study, with the help of Jeff Corey, who is owner of Dave's Jewelers, and we're going to walk through what was our data breach scenario back in January of 2011. I do want to say that from a crisis communication, a PR crisis communication standpoint, I found that every case of data breach, PR recovery to be quite different for every business. Obviously, there are breach notification laws that vary for every state. There are over 40 variations of breach notification laws throughout the U.S. now. The depth of the breach, the audience, and the stakeholders vary. So every business is going to be different. 
but we hope that you can take away some very valuable information to prepare you for what is a worst case scenario for what you might encounter with your own company. So we're going to look at kind of this broad, high level overview right now. And um, as we mentioned, New England based retailer Dave's Jewelers survived an IT and PR nightmare. It was a data breach back in 2011, which tapped into the information of tens of thousands of customers. Now, Days at the time used a proprietary industry software, which is like most software today, is vulnerable to today's hackers. This is a 100-year-old business. This is a business that just in just a moment is it relies on the trust and the loyalty from its customers. But with a very strategic plan, a PR plan, we deployed, and also an IT plan with an integrated team. Um, Days is still very much alive today and it's worse since this data breach. So I think we should, um, Jeff, I want to introduce you and bring you into the fold now and tell us a little bit about the history of Dave's Jewelers. Uh, sure, uh, Diana, thank you. Um, as I said earlier, Dave's uh, was founded in 1914 in Portland, Maine uh, by a dad and his uh, three sons. Uh, the company grew to 22 stores, uh, being, I believe, the largest retail jeweler in northern New England. Um, they grew, uh, you know, on the basis of exceptional customer service. I mean, their mission was always to win a customer for life rather than make a, a quick sale. Uh, Days was one of the first jewelers in America to offer in-house credit. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, the brothers uh, were looking to retire, and they tried selling the company intact. But in those days, um, the, the big guys were looking to be in malls, and Days stores were all in downtown locations. So they closed 21 of the 22 stores, and in 1984, uh, or 1988, I got a phone call from the owner of Days, and um, at the time, my wife and I had um, a, our own jewelry store in Waterville, Maine, called Jeffrey's Fine Jewelers, and it was a, a, it, we had opened four years prior, and it was a very, very successful business. Um, and so Mr. Davidson called me and he said, Jeff, um, my brother and I <clears throat> are looking um, to retire and we see how well you and Kathy have done in your business in Waterville and we want you to buy days and revive it. Uh, we thought that was an intriguing idea and uh, after five, uh, five banks, we uh, finally found one foolish enough to lend us some money and we made the decision to uh, buy the Days uh, Corporation, or the last remaining Days store. Uh, so at the time, we had a decision to make. Do we, um, we had one store named Jeffrey's Jewelers and one named Days, um, and we had to make the decision of which we were going to keep. And we decided on Days, basically because of uh, Days' incredible reputation throughout uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, reputation for very, very solid customer service and also uh, a database which was then on ledger cards of, um, you know, probably uh, over 200,000, 300,000 uh, people. So um, we set out to rebuild days, uh, clearly defined our mission as uh, to build a company that stands the test of time. Our core strategy was to win um, customers for life one customer at, at a time. Um, we, uh, first thing we did is melded the, those tried and true day's values with um, new world technology. We converted all of the databases from ledger cards to uh, our computer system. Um, and uh, then over the following 20 years, we opened 20 more stores, or I'm sorry, four more stores in Maine and New Hampshire, as well as a robust e-commerce website. Uh, we have always been particularly cautious to protect customer data. Um, over the years, I recall in our board meetings when the IT team would come in and say, we need $10,000 for this or $20,000 for this firewall. And we always um, bit the bullet and we said if it's in the name of uh, securing our customers' uh, data, let's, uh, let's, let's do it. And so, you know, we had uh, invested significantly in data protection and firewalls. Uh, we had uh, third parties trying to penetrate 
uh, do penetration testing for vulnerability on our system every quarter. We were uh, PCI certified. We had encryption devices at all POS terminals. And so on January of 2011, on this, I'll never forget this snowy uh, Monday morning uh, when we got a knock on the door uh, from uh, representatives from the Secret Service and the Maine State Police Computer Crimes Division. And I was very fortunate to have a well-qualified IT team. But uh, what had happened is they were monitoring a group out of the Ukraine, uh, a group of hackers and from their offices in Seattle, and they detected um, information going over the pipeline from our IP address. So they immediately deployed uh, their uh, Secret Service main contingent to our building, and uh, they took control of um, our uh, computer systems, and um, it was a nightmare. And I want to I want to chime in here right now, um, and, and just let our, our listeners know that that this is the, really the start of the timeline of what happened with Dave. That literally, you had a knock on the door, didn't you, Jeff? <laughs> in terms of the investigators showing up. Um, to say that there had been a breach. All right. So, uh, do you want me to continue on as to what we did, Diana? Yeah, I, th I think I'd like to talk about because that was the beginning of, and I want to just kind of put this in context as we go into our timeline to let uh, those listening know how long this timeline that we're talking about right now in the next few slides will be. We're looking at about a month and a half from the time that you found out you had that knock on the door at Days and the federal investigators and Maine State Police stepped in to the time that this went public. And what we're going to talk about in the next few slides is really looking at how we manage that. And I know that once the investigators came in to say that they had been monitoring and found out that there had been a breach, we formed or you formed a team, an internal team, to really look at how this was going to be handled. And um, we, should, we should probably look at the components of that team right now, and I know that that started, Jeff, with an internal lead within your company, and it wasn't really you, was it? It was, a, it was somebody else within the company. Right, right. We uh, mobilized our executive committee, mm -hmm. and uh, which included um, our VP of Finance, who oversees our IT department, um, also our marketing, um, our, our VP of Marketing, okay. uh, VP of Personnel, our company president, myself, and... Uh, we selected a person to be our lead. Uh, we immediately notified our bank card provider that there was a, a potential potential breach. And of course, at that time, we had no idea if there was information that sensitive information that was uh, taken, and we did we had no idea how many customers, if any, were affected. Uh, we uh, notified our insurance company. Uh, notified our attorney, and uh, the, our lead person over the ensuing a couple of days interviewed several representatives from companies who had previously experienced a breach. And all of this information, anyone who's experienced a breach, is required by law to report it, so it becomes public information. So there was a lot of information available. And um, then we had to make the decision to hire a public relations firm. And the question was, do we hire a firm, uh, a local firm, or do we hire a firm from the outside who has lots of experience with companies who have experienced data breaches? And in the end, uh, we decided on Diana. We knew Diana. Uh, she was well known in the state of Maine, and we believed the people in our state would trust what she had to say. Um, so, um, and then we made the decision uh, not to notify uh, customers yet because the uh, social, uh, Secret Service asked us to maintain silence. And of course, we had no idea what customer info was acquired, if any. Mm -hmm. And I think that this was an important point to bring up to those people who are, who are listening in right now that, and how every case is very different is, as you, think, as you and as Dave put together this internal team, we still did not know, the internal team nor the federal and state investigators, no one really knew the depth and the breadth of really the data breach at the time. So those, 
breach notification laws really didn't kick in at any point because we still were finding out exactly what was happening. And when you start talking about that, and if you're looking at it from a PR perspective, that gives you some time when you start formulating what your next moves are going to be and how you're going to move forward with notification and also in talking with, with the media investigators. I do remember, Jeff, this team that we had with the internal lead, the IT forensic team, the legal team, and myself, Fletcher Media, we worked together every single day, and, and we were working with federal and state investigators. Um, and that was an important point to bring up because they were constantly trying to figure out what had, you know, what the data breach entailed, how far it went, and then that was important to our PR messaging. So we basically um, had a point where in January, after um, you know, the days found out about the problem, and from a PR perspective, we were looking at how are we going to pull together our PR external messaging and our, also our internal messaging. And what I think is really important to talk about from a PR perspective is that anybody who um, anybody who's an employee who is internal, it's important to make certain that they know what you know, but you need to, to be very careful to control that. And I know that if we need to speak about this briefly, Jeff, when this first when the incident the incident first happened in January, very few workers within days knew what happened. Correct, and you were very good at really containing that until you could get all of that, you know, get all of your information together. Like you did not tell all 100 plus employees at all, because you really needed to contain that message. Well, we didn't. Although our co uh, company is is uh, based, one of our basic values is we will always operate our business in an environment of trust and transparency. So, you know, we didn't want our employees to be surprised. So eventually, and I can't recall exactly uh, the, the timeline, but we did release a statement to our employees stating there is a possibility that, and you know, this is confidential information. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. and I think it's very important that we bring up um, for those listening is that those people within your company, you, you need to stress that it's confidential information, but also realize that they can get that information out very. Uh, always be aware of emails that you send um, and messages that you send. So that's part of looking at your PR internal messaging and your external messaging. Looking at the stakeholders and then looking at um, you know the audiences that you need to speak to. And um, some of the stakeholders, which we actually have in another slide, but I'll go through those right now, would be those considered to be uh, the employees of a company, obviously the internal software provider in this case that where the breach um, happened, um, customers obviously, credit unions and banks, bank card processing centers, and as um, you know, Jeff mentioned, he, he reached out to the, the banks immediately. And I do know that Bob was there other stakeholders who are involved in this as well that we need to consider. Yes, uh, regulators, law enforcement, for example, are two that are um, clearly some stakeholders that are involved here as well that you want to keep in touch. And, you, and you've mentioned the major other ones as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that when this happens, when everything really starts to go down, that the, the team looks at who, who is the audience, who do we need to speak with, who do we need to speak to, and how are we going to form those messages, both externally and internally. In this case, with days, um, what we weighed the entire time from a PR perspective was the depth and breadth. It's still uncertain, and I, we talked about this every day, Jeff, as we went through this, is that we, we were getting updates. I felt almost hourly from the investigators as to, you know, what was gleaned, what information was accessed, um, because that was still a big question as we went into a couple weeks into it. Um, the number of customers impacted. As you've mentioned, it, uh, Jeff, that your, your database, I believe, is 400,000 and names that you have in your database. Uh, what data is it with? And then obviously for everyone, it's the notification requirements, which are different in every state. I think something that was really important that I wanted to bring up too is that you know, this broke the beginning of January, um, so that you, kn you knew that the beginning of January and days that after that point, the data is secure, everything is fine. 
but you are also going into Valentine's Day sales. So you are looking at that February 14th date as being very vital to you in your business. Right. It's the second most important season in the jewelry business. So it could have uh, significantly impacted our, uh, our sales. Yeah. So it was, um, it was a trying time, I will say, <laughs> in terms of uh, well, looking back at it calendar-wise, everything that we were looking at timing-wise, how everything was coming up. So again, the, the data breach, actually, the investigators came in the beginning of January, and that's when, when they found out about everything. And then this is kind of how the timeline played out from a PR and media perspective, um, is that the data breach was revealed February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, and the data breach was outed basically on live TV. Um, and I do want to say, in just a moment, we were completely prepared for this. We knew when it was going to be revealed or about the time it would be revealed, but we were ready for it, and that's the, the point that we'll, we'll go over in just a few moments. So when that happened in a live interview, the main credit union league president was doing a live interview on the NBC affiliate during the noon show and mentioned that there had been a data breach and all of the customers linked back to one, one business. And days was mentioned. So within five minutes, I had a phone call <laughs> from somebody at one of the news stations and then it followed right after that. But we were prepared. We had prepared from a PR perspective with the team as to how we would handle this. And that meant that when we got that first phone call, we had one statement that we put out, which we will look at in a moment. It was a final classification statement that was put together with Maine State Police and investigators. Every single word was crafted with the entire team, the legal team, the IT team, the leadership team. That one press statement was ready. Investigators, this is very important, and we'll look at that press statement in just a moment, but investigators were uh, agreed to be part of this, and um, we could use their name as a contact. So when we told the press, gave them this press release, also there was an investigator listed as a contact person who could also speak. But they decided not to do any, any interviews. We decided we would not go on camera with anyone at any point. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. That was difficult for Jeff. Jeff, as you can tell, is a very passionate owner and president of the company. So we'll talk in a little bit more about our reasons behind that. But the investigation, too, was still ongoing. Even though this was leaked to the media, we could not talk about the investigation because it was ongoing. And we could always fall back on that reason. I'm going to, this next slide here is the actual press release that was put out on February 15th, right after that interview broke with the information about Bayes Jewelers. Um, and if you look at this press release and you go through it paragraph by paragraph, the first paragraph, well first at the heading we have the contact information for both myself because I acted as the liaison between Dave and the press. And then also Glenn Lang, who was with the Maine State Computer Crimes Unit. Many reporters had already dealt with Glenn, and the fact that we, he would lend his name and let us use his name as part of this investigation was huge. Because it, it again, it, it showed to the media that we, that Dave was a victim. Dave was a victim in this entire incident. So if you look at each paragraph, the first paragraph, we really just talk about facts. We can't reveal much about the details because it is an ongoing investigation. And if you read the second paragraph, we show the details that we can release. And we also show that Dave took immediate action. Um, one of the important things to point out is that when um, Dave found out about the breach, they called in an IT forensic team. And it's not only important for recovering and be able to continue business in the retail business, but we could talk about that in our press release and talk about that in our ongoing recovery, PR recovery, that we had our own, we took immediate action and we have our own forensic team that's working on this. 
the third paragraph or continue our action and that your data is secure. That's what customers want to hear. That even though the investigation is continuing, a likely time frame has been determined and this narrows the number of days customers that have been affected by any security breach and your data is secure. In the fourth paragraph, we bring in Jeff and what we do know is that the online customers are not affected. It was another fact that we didn't know at the time. And then this is where we talk directly to the customers. Um, our customers are a primary concern and we are working diligently with law enforcement. In the sixth paragraph, we are continuing to work and we work for you and this is how you can contact us. This 800 number was part of our phone bank, so we'll talk about this in just a moment as to the venues and the channels of, of, um, of outreach to the customers. So for the channels of, of outreach, um, you really have to decide how you're going to talk with your customers. You know, obviously for the media, what was most important to us was to actually just have um, one statement that would go out and not have an interview. And so these are the different channels that we have right now. We have, we were looking at doing in-store. This is really employees trained to talk with the customers who would walk in. The phone bank, which is the 800 number that we have at the bottom of the press release. That is a way for customers to reach out directly to Dave and um, find out more about what can be done. If they find any um, unusual charges on their credit card or where they should go. Emails direct from customer, we're going to talk about those just in just a moment. Those have all pulled together, but those were, it was one email that went out to all the customers and that, those were also handled in a certain way. We'll look at those in just a moment. Notification required by data breach laws. That kicked in when the investigation said, well, we actually knew how many, um, how many people were affected, thought to be affected, and what type of information was actually gleaned during the breach. And I some, we just received a, a question from someone who's listening in how, asking why um, they didn't um, volunteer notice of the breach and waited for the information to become public first. That's because we didn't know the extent of the breach. Uh, that's something that, that's, that's a great question because we went back and forth with legal talking about when do we talk about this, when, when is the best time to discuss this. We couldn't because it was an ongoing investigation and we did not know the extent of the breach. How many people could be affected and what information was also taken because of it. And then I have here and, and one of the one of my notes here is what to do with Jeff. Um, again, Jeff is a very passionate owner and president of a company and as a team we decided we did not want Jeff to do any on camera interviews. <laughs> do you remember this, Jeff? I do. <laughs> Because you wanted to. <laughs> you wanted to be on camera. And um, you, you, Jeff, you're great on camera. You're, you have great sound bites. I've worked with you for so many years. But part of it was because you were so passionate and so upset about what happened. Um, you took it very personally. And we didn't want you to be off message, correct? Do you remember this conversation? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and I, you know, I, Diana, these are my customers. And every single customer is very, very important to me. And I want to make sure that they have a sense of comfort. Um, and, uh, but um, you held me back. <laughs> and I will say it wasn't, it, it wasn't just me. I think it was, it was definitely the consensus of the entire team mm -hmm. that worked together. And it was difficult because I, as a, as a PR person, and I think that if a lot of us do see these data breaches, and I can even think of, you know, maybe targets one of them where they thought that maybe the president should have come out, the CEO should have come out earlier to be more empathetic with customers. But there is a point where you really have to message everything to, because there's so much you still don't know about. But for Jeff, it was very personal. And in this case, with this particular client, we did tell you not to do any interviews. And, and you were never on, and as, as I recall, the only time you've actually ever talked about this breach is now post-breach a couple years after. Um, but we will in a moment go to your emails that you did send to um, send your customers that was crafted as well. So messaging is very, very important for the outreach strategy because everything is based off the same message. It goes back to the press release. 
I want to say very quickly too, if you go back, that um, someone just gave us a comment about the, the, the press statement being well crafted. If you go back and look at Dave Jeweler's data breach, you will see that every single story that we had to cover it, we had the same response because it was one press statement that we used, which was very, it was really the best way to approach it. Um, and, and it's important to say that we need to have that training for all the employees because the, tr the employees need to be saying the same thing. So we train all of the employees so that when we had customers, because think of you know the five retail areas, customers walking in, the employees could respond to the customers in the exact same way. So giving them the same information that they see in the press statement, in the news, and um, it, it's the same message all the way across. This is the follow-up email that was crafted for Jeff to send out to, to answer the email inquiries that came in, if you'd like to read through this. And it's very similar to the press statement, but it's much more heartfelt. And this we held off on, and you can correct me on this, Jeff, how long, because you received and answered hundreds of emails, from what I can remember. Um, and we just looked over those, those recently, and we'll show you some of the responses. But this is crafted from that press release but it's also very heartfelt. Um, and this is where Jeff really is speaking. In my 40 years in business, I've never faced a situation more frustrating and embarrassing. Since my wife Kathy and I purchased days 22 years ago, our most important objective has been to deliver outstanding service to our customers. I'm sure you can imagine how devastating this was for us. And you can read through this. And it's very heartfelt. This is very much Jeff. From what I recall, you wrote it and you tweaked it a little bit, just to make certain right. that everybody was getting the same message. Right. And, right. Is, and when you started reading those responses from those customers in response to your email, tell us a little bit about that reaction. Well, I, you know, I received actually uh, even before the uh, press uh, released the story. I got a phone call one day from a woman, uh, just as an example. She said, uh, Jeff, uh, she said, my credit card uh, I, was breached over the weekend. And uh, when I got to work on Monday morning, eight of my coworkers also had their uh, credit cards breached. And it just so happens that the nine of us were at a special event that you put on in one of our homes, and all of us used our credit card at that event. And a uh, call from another man saying that uh, he had a brand new American Express card, only used it at one place, and the card was breached. So, you know, one thing that I did is, is I did not screen calls. If people wanted to speak to me, they could get a hold of me w w without screening. I personally answered every single email that came through regarding the breach. And, and you know, what that did uh, was um, it, 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 people would tell their friends, gosh, the president and owner of Days uh, actually called me and I spoke to him on the phone about this and, or he actually emailed me. And so then it, it became viral, uh, even on social networks, when, when someone would uh, log a post that was derogatory towards days, um, many of our customers would come back and, and, and um, support us I, and say this was, days was the victim here. And so we tried to be as transparent as we could and, and to be as personal as we could because our customers are like our family and we treated them that way. And I think you can see that from some of the email responses. And again, these are only, us these are four of hundreds of email responses, and the way that those um, was, um, customers came to the defense of days, and I think it's also important. You know, these are your ambassadors. These are those people who are who are going out, and as you said, they're telling everyone in the community, and they're on board, and they back you. And, it, and the reality is, days was a victim. Days was a victim in what happened here, and some of those people in the emails you see here, and others responded to that and knew that. And they were they were back. They came, you know, they came back today. They weren't gone for very long, if at all. So it was really great to see that. Um, when you look at, if we look at kind of some of the strategies that we've 
taken away or what we can talk about from either the day's, you know, the, the day's data breach or, or something that you may face down the line. I want to kind of go over a few things that are very important to consider, some kind of PR takeaways from here in the next few slides. Um, the PR statement really is the foundation of your PR strategy. And again, I want to thank Mark who sent in a, a Q&A to say that it was a, a well-crafted statement. It, it was really the entire team that put that together, and it really is going to be the basis of your story because it is your story. Um, you need to be transparent and tell people what you can tell them and what you do know. But that press statement is very important. Again, determine who's your stakeholders and audience. You know, who, who are your stakeholders? Who are you speaking to? Because every statement that goes out needs to speak to those stakeholders in some way. It is great that we were able to pull in investigators as part of our messaging because the investigation was ongoing. Um, and that's it's great to be able to do that because you know, also the reporters, because I can only give them the statements that I've sent along and can't give them any interviews on camera or in person or on a phone, they can talk to the investigators to get more information. And they will have the very latest as of what can be, you know, what information can go out to the media. It's important to be consistent with everything that you say and be transparent as much as you can because you want your customers to know that, you know, we're, we're in this together, we're trying to figure out what is going on and really base everything upon facts. Even if you're being empathetic, even though, even if you're being emotional as Jeff really was in his, his email that went out to customers, you still are relying on facts. You still, you know, Jeff can still say the investigation is ongoing and we're doing the best that we can to get that, to find out exactly how many people are affected. That is a fact. I put in media training here, even though, you know, Jeff was already media trained. We decided not to put him in front of the camera. But it's important, I think, for every small business to remember media training is important. If you do decide to go that route when you do have a data breach, a crisis can happen at any time. Somebody should be ready to speak to reporters and feel confident that they can speak on message for whatever the crisis is in, in data breach um, recovery, who will represent your company, company. And remember, it's not just about who is on camera, but again, everybody in a company should be trained as to why they need to stay on message, why they need to talk about certain things about the data breach and what they can talk about. It's important to bring your employees into that fold as well. Um, Data breach communication strategies, again, if you do do interviews, again, we did not in this case, but if you do, determine what role interviews will play if they're important. Again, in this case, we say if we decided interviews would not help us. As much as we wanted to put Jeff on camera, we decided not to do that. Who will represent your company and make certain that that person appears transparent and is transparent and also can relate to your audience and stakeholders? Where you conduct your interviews is very important. Um, this is an important point in any crisis communication, but I don't think if you are doing, let's say, I, um, you're doing a TV interview, you may not want to have the interview conducted at your place of business. Um, you don't want to have television cameras there to remind your customers, again, if you're retail, why they're there. You may want to do it in studio or you may want to do it at another location, so it's very important to consider. Think about if you want to do a press conference, if your data breach and you're within the notification law requirements, the timing is important, you know, that you're within the times that you have to notify the public. Um, consider maybe doing a press conference to address all of the press at one time or if individual interviews would be better. These are all factors that you can consider if interviews play a part in your data breach recovery. Message points are the most important part. Determine your end goal and work from there. Um, you know, the end goal with, with Dave and with Jeff was really to keep the trust of the customers. And I would assume that most every business has that same end goal. So where do you go from there? I mean, where, where do you want to work back from there to, to keep that trust? Always look at the messages that you have. And if you have not gone through crisis training within your company, it's a very important part of crisis training and crisis preparation is message mapping. What are your three most important messages and how do you put those into every single statement that you make? Train not only your spokesperson but every member of your team. And again, this, this speaks 
to employees, anybody who may be interacting with customers, anybody who may be out in the field for your company and working with vendors, that's something else to think about. Every member of your team should know what your message points are during the data breach and what they should be saying. And really build those messages and stick with them on every level of your company. It's very important. So the data breach PR takeaways, I think when it comes to data breach recovery, is realize it's not this, but it's when for a lot of companies. And I think Bob can, he, you know, talked about the statistics very early on with small businesses, and it's something we should all be thinking about. Assess your IT vulnerabilities, which Bob will go into again in just a few moments. Build the bank of good PR. And this is something that Dave did a great job of prior to the data breach. And, and Jeff, if you want to talk a little bit about that, I think it's really important to, um, to talk about how important you are, uh, your company is within the Maine and New Hampshire communities because you really have put a, an emphasis on building your communities and reaching out to a lot of folks to build that bank of good PR. Right, right. Alessa, you know, we have to make a decision as to whether or not to um, have a central uh, phone bank of, uh, with an external uh, company handling it uh, to answer uh, customer questions. Or, and we made the decision to uh, leave it internal and allow any one of our staff members across the company to respond to the customer. And the reason why we did that is because of um, the, the many, many personal relationships we have with our customer, between the customer and our sales associate. So when the customer heard the information from the person at Days who they've done business with, it made it more personal, more, personal, more believable, and uh, more trusted. I think that that's such a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because it also goes back to talking a little bit about the PR, too, and how we approach the PR being very localized um, and working one-on-one -on -one with reporters in terms of even though it was just a press statement, really getting that out. So I think it's very important right. to talk about that. Right. Um, and go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, uh, you, you know, just to speak about, uh, you know, what we did subsequent to, to the breach. I mean, today, um, I mean, we had to rebuild all of our uh, PCs. We had to wipe clean all of our servers. Uh, we purchased all new POS systems. And, and immediately, we took our, uh, our credit card clearing devices were part of our POS system, and we took them offline uh, after the breach, and, and uh, they still are offline. We are using an absolutely independent terminal to clear credit cards in all of our stores. It is cumbersome. But until I can be absolutely 100% comfortable that the data in these uh, swipe machines um, cannot be acquired by a hacker, then we're going to keep them independent. Yeah. And I think that's important to bring up. Um, I want to just go to these last two um, message points here and then go into what Bob, and I think Bob can speak a little bit more about the PCI compliance and what you've done since then. Um, identify your internal logistics team and identify your stakeholders. Those are very important PR takeaways for any crisis. But I want to go um, now to and uh, look at a few more. I'm sorry. <laughs> Open your channels of communication with customers, which actually Jeff just spoke about in terms of actually having that, that phone bank being very local and not actually pushing that out to someplace else. Be friendly with your local media or hire a PR professional who will. Uh, that's very important. Know your notification laws and transparency and empathy are very key to data breach takeaways. Now, I think we can circle back around, and I'm going to hand this back over to Bob. And I think you can talk a little bit more about the compliance issues before and after with with the days as well. Yeah, thanks, Diane. I, you know, the information you provided, you both provided, is great. As privacy professionals, we often get focused on um, what to, how to prevent breaches, how to protect information, and what to do to be compliant with the law. But bringing in the PR aspect and explaining how to maintain those customer relationships is just fantastic. So 
So thank you. Um, from a, a, one question I did have, um, and Jeff, maybe you can answer, was there things that you guys have done operationally um, beyond the detachment of the, uh, the credit card readers? Have you done anything operationally different within the organization since the breach? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, several things. Uh, first of all, we, um, we, we have um, a third party uh, penetrate, uh, try to penetrate our system, um, uh, let's see, monthly. And uh, PCI compliance, I mean, we were PCI compliant to a level far greater than what we're required to be by our uh, credit card clearing organization. Um, training within the organization, privacy and uh, data security training is ongoing. Um, it's something we do with every new employee as soon as they're hired. We have training sessions annually for uh, current employees. Um, we have um, dual auth authentication before anyone can log in externally into our systems. Uh, we've employed several measures uh, subsequent to the breach. And my attitude is that uh, it, we'll get breached again. Uh, it's inevitable. And the question for me is, what will the hacker acquire? And so we've wiped clean our system of any information, customer information that isn't absolutely essential for, for instance, social security numbers. Um, you know, all of our charge account customers, and we probably have about you know, 100,000 charge account customers, and we had their social security information in the system. And that's all been wiped clean. Uh, we do not store uh, any credit card numbers at all. Everything is encrypted. Uh, our employees are trained not to write down a credit card number or CVV number at any time, especially not through email. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're very, very conscious of it at this point. But it, the attitude is that don't store the information if you don't absolutely need it. That's, that's great. Um, all great. All great measures to take. You know, um, from, a, from a prevention standpoint, um, when I, I talk to my small business clients, the things I recommend right off the top is just some basic foundational privacy practices. Um, things that uh, privacy professionals who are listening to this will take to heart as things that are just basic first steps. Um, the number one thing I've always found is to designate a privacy owner. I've, I've walked into more organizations um, where everybody owns privacy, so ultimately no one does, or the, the CEO, the president owns privacy. And with everything else on their plate, it, it kind of gets a short shrift of, of what needs to be done. So designating a privacy owner will allow an organization to put some focus to it, um, to allow that owner to keep up to date with what requirements are. For example, here in Florida, there's a, a new data breach law that came into effect last week. If you're dealing with uh, children's marketing, there were new guidelines put out for COPPA today, uh, yesterday. All those things a privacy owner can keep up to date with. Um, the second thing I recommend is to figure out what you have in place, um, what the in, um, personal information you have. And just as Dave explained, that they took a look and found out what was necessary and got rid of things that were not necessary to keep in their systems. But take that data inventory, um, figure out what the applicable statutes and regulations you need to comply with. If the information is important, protect it, encrypt it, as, as they did at days. Or if it's not really necessary, get rid of it, because if you don't have it, you can't lose it, thereby minimizing um, the duration of the breach. Um, you can do a privacy assessment. There, um, I'll share you one tool with you on the next page that can be done independently. Of course, you can bring in um, a, a third party to do those assessments as well. Um, if you don't have privacy, security, and computer use policies, you can put them in place. There are a number of resources online um, where you can um, get some um, templates for those. The one thing I do um, uh, warn against, because I see this happen very often, is that the, the, the policies and even the privacy notice that appears on the website um, 
will just be taken from another organization and not tailored to the particular company. Um, and what that ends up doing is that the, the, the policies and the, the notice are meaningless because it has no applicability to what's going on. Training and awareness are very important. Dave, I was glad to hear that every time a new hire comes on um, that they get trained in privacy. That doesn't happen in some large enterprises, but that's an important step um, so that um, new hires know what they should be doing. And as we've seen through, um, through recent events, um, vendors contain, hold your own personal information if at minimum they hold uh, credentials to log into your systems. So you need to make sure the vendors are doing things properly for you as well to protect the information you're giving them as well as to protect the credentials that give them access to your systems. But I think most importantly is planning and preparing. You know, as Diana said, it's not if but when. You talk to a security professional and they'll tell you that there are two types of companies those that have been breached and those that don't know they've been breached. And you need to take a step back. And all the steps that Diana talked about, I'm sure, are very time consuming. And, um, but the, the real business, the full business of days, had to go on while all this was happening as well. So taking the time to develop a crisis communication plan, an incident response plan, figuring out all the roles and responsibilities is key to um, smooth um, smooth reaction when a breach does occur. And do a tabletop exercise. Practice. Make sure that people know the roles and see how things happen and make sure that the, the plan actually does work. Um, we did a, a, a couple of tabletop exercises with some small companies over the past month. And it was interesting to see how the plan, while would have been effective, uh, effective um, when the individual contributors who were participating in the plan actually exercised it, found that there were things that just didn't quite sound right or did, didn't quite feel right. So we went back and we tailored that protection for them. As I mentioned, there, uh, there are resources available to you. Um, this is just a list of some resources that you can use. I always recommend the IAPP Resource Center. IAPP does a great job of putting information together and making it available to its members. Um, please, if you haven't visited that yet, go out and take a look. There is information there for small business and on most of the topics we've talked about today. If you have uh, difficulty trying to communicate um, how important this is to, to upper management in some cases, um, I, would, I would take a, a, a step forward and um, look at the Privacy Rights Organization, uh, Clearinghouse website. They have a list of uh, data breaches from all sizes of organizations in all industries that occurred over the past several years. Uh, Small Business Administration has a privacy law website. The attorneys generals have websites. I've picked Mass uh, Governor's uh, Mass Massachusetts State website here. Um, I recently visited the Vermont website as well. Very good information in both of those places. And if you want to do a um, your own assessment of um, how the privacy program is at a particular site. Um, I frequently use the generally accepted privacy practices maturity model that's available from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. It's a free model. You can download it um, and actually assess how your program is. Now, it, it is geared for large enterprises, but you can see what would work for your organization and what wouldn't. And finally, there are privacy specialists that can help. Um, Frequently you hear about some of the large companies, but the number of independent privacy specialists out there, and we're always glad to step in and help. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Dave, and uh, thank you all for your uh, participation. Look forward to some of the questions that are out there. Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, thanks Jeff and Diana for that excellent presentation. I hope that those of you that are signed on with us here are getting um, a great view into it. Um, uh, what was a difficult situation that I think was handled just about as well as can be handled. Uh, there's some great best practices embedded in this example. And um, kudos to, uh, to you, Diana and, and Jeff, for taking it so seriously and handling it so well. Uh, I think it sets a good uh, standard for, for um, many of those out there wrestling with similar issues. So with that, we do have a couple questions in, and I might remind you uh, in the remaining time that we have, if you have a question, uh, just type it into the field to the right of the PowerPoint window, and then um, submit it to us and we will handle as many of the questions as we can. And uh, to get started here, um, one of the questions that came in has to do with um, the decision to uh, why didn't, uh, actually this was already covered, I'm sorry, about uh, whether the, 
the breach became public first uh, through the media as opposed to being ex um, exposed. So it's been handled, I believe. Are there any further comments on that, or, or have, we, have we covered that fully? Jeff, Diana? I just wanted to chime in on that because it's a very good question that was sent along to us. And it was, you know, it's something that we worked on with legal because we didn't know when the clock was ticking. And the reality was, at least in, back in 2011, the clock wasn't ticking because we didn't even know what information had been gleaned and how expensive it was. And I can remember, you know, going back and forth with Jeff and the team, what do we know, what do we know? And, you know, it, it felt like days were going by and we still did not know. So it's really important, and, and, and data breach security laws have changed even since then. As, as Bob can attest to, there, you know, there are 40 plus in the U.S. and, you know, they're, they're different in every state. Um, obviously, they're, you know, how you're going to deal with it and when that timeline, that clock is ticking and when the notification, you know, actually needs to happen. So for, for days, it was really getting, you know, getting our arms around what we could talk about and crafting that message and being ready for it. Right. And we, we didn't, uh, we, you know, we had contemplated a public statement, but um, we really couldn't do this because the Secret Service uh, obviously was trying to apprehend the perpetrator and asked us to keep it silent. Secondly, um, we couldn't in, uh, notify individual customers because we didn't know specifically who was breached. Mm -hmm. Very important point. Um, that's great. Here's another question. Interesting. This is for you, Jeff. Uh, what advice do you have for the target CEO? <laughs> Tra transparency. Transparency. I, I think that. Um, People today understand that this stuff happens, and what they don't understand is that if you hide information, it, and it makes um, it makes people suspicious. It's uh, being humble and uh, straightforward, and um, don't withhold information. There's no point in it. That's great. You know, on that note, Bob, I'm curious as to your having worked in the field now both for large organizations and for the last couple of years with smaller organizations, do you find that that's a general trend or, or is, the, um, is it the reverse is true, is that uh, the natural knee-jerk reaction for small organizations once they've experienced a breach to try to uh, hold their cards close to the vest and, and not be as transparent? What, what's your experience with that, Bob? I, I, I think that the, what I found is that the, the knee-jerk reaction um, is to try to keep things quiet um, to for, for embarrassment for, for due reasons due to embarrassment if nothing else look what happened to us and and, and we need it you know why would you tell people about this um, but there's also um, a lack of knowledge about what the requirements are and what the impacts of law enforcement and liabilities are so Getting a, a legal team involved to try to express that and understand, and working with law enforcement to understand what they can and can't say and what they have to say is an important step to it. Over time, what I think we find, and um, using, uh, using Target as an example of this, over time more and more information came out about what happened. But everyone that I've spoken to um, over the past several months is basically said the same thing as Diana and Jeff. It's better to be um, transparent proactively as opposed to waiting for things to drag out over time. So um, be as transparent as you possibly can to let people know what happened. It helps engender that trust, especially with that with the small business, because that's what a lot of your um, customers are looking for, to retain that trust in you. Right. Yeah. There's a, a, a question here regarding the hardware changes. And uh, you know what puzzled us um, is that our card swipe machines, uh, the swiper was attached to the, uh, to the POS terminal and was immediately encrypted before the information was transmitted to the credit card clearing house. And so how in a world, if the, if the information is, is encrypted, how did they download those credit card numbers? And what actually happened is the malware was installed in the reader device itself. And, and so um, even today, and, and this is what surprised me about the target situation, that is exactly 
what happened uh, at Target. Uh, the uh, malware was in the reader device itself. So what we've done is just taken the reader device offline, and we have a separate dedicated credit card clearing terminal, which is in no way connected to our internal database. And it's wiped clean daily. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, another um, thing, uh, for, uh, this is an issue for you, Jeff, and, and Diana, I think. How did the um, response, because you're so uh, devoted and uh, caring of, of your customers and, and would have done um, you know, notice and response uh, just because it's the right thing to do, curious as to how that matched up with the legal requirements to notify. Did you find that the legal requirements actually were uh, made a lot of sense or there was some um, uh, mismatch between what you would have done just as a company owner because you believed it was the right thing to do and what was required of you legally? No, I think they coincided uh, quite well. Um, I, I think the legal requirements are, are, are exactly as they should be. Great. That's great. Well, with that, um, we have just, I think, I'm sorry? Now, there was another question about the costs. Yes. Uh, and, you know, we, we have, it was very difficult to, an establish, to establish a cost to this. I mean, our greatest fear, too, other than our customer, the loss of customers, was what was the credit card clearing, our credit card companies going to fine us? We knew there was going to be a fine. And uh, trying to ascertain what that fine would be was very difficult. They, the, the answer was anywhere from $5,000 to a $1 million. And so, it, you know, it, um, it turned out to be minimal uh, because of all the work we did immediately uh, subsequent to the breach. Um, they um, were easy on us. But we spent uh, an incredible amount of time internally. I mean, our IT department was working uh, at, for the first week. They were, on, they were staffed 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, we all were working around the clock also. So a lot of the, the expense was internally. It's very difficult to measure the loss of business also. And the forensic teams, bringing them in was very expensive. Uh, and of course, uh, buying all new computers, uh, which we did, was, uh, was a great expense. So I don't have the exact cost, but it was uh, substantial. That's great. And um, we uh, do have another question here uh, with regards to um, the perpetrators of, of the crime uh, that, that happened at Days. Do you have any information about that, any follow-up? Well, I'm uh, very pleased to announce, and, and I got the message uh, actually on Sunday, uh -huh. that the perpetrator was captured in Guam uh, on, I think it's uh, July 8th. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, it was a New York uh, Times article and actually mentioned uh, Days Jewelers in the article, mm -hmm. along with mm -hmm. several others. That's great. And um, I think to, to wrap up here, uh, uh, I wanted to mention to the audience out there uh, that we received several um, very um, uh, complimentary comments uh, from you about uh, both the way uh, Jeff and, and Diana and, and Days handled this incident and how it is a bit uh, unusual, as Bob mentions, uh, where the tendency is to um, maybe not be as transparent. Uh, there's uh, some praise that came in for, for both of you that I want to share with the entire audience about um, being transparent and doing everything you could to um, uh, both uh, uh, re-secure the systems and uh, to, uh, that, the, that the perpetrators were caught and to just be f uh, out front and forward with your customers with this. So a lot of kudos from the community and, hope, and hopefully setting a, a very good example for other small businesses. We, do so, wanna, we want to say thank you for that. And I do know that one person in particular asked why we decided and Dave decided to talk about this breach experience. And I can remember back very shortly after it happened, Jeff wanted to go, he wanted to go public with it and talk more about it. I think it was within six months, wasn't it, Jeff, that you wanted to do a um, story with one of the, um, the main business, uh, main business, which is our state um, business journal. 
Right. And and at the time, I said, no, I think you better hold off and wait a little bit longer and, and get, put some distance between the database itself and before talking about it. But I think that you are very brave to go forward with it, and I know you've spoken with um, other members of the jewelry community, other jewelers across the country, I believe, at one of the association meetings about this as well. Yes, and, and it's, again, it's quite surprising to me that how few businesses understand how vulnerable they are through these uh, credit card clearing or uh, swipe devices. And I would, um, anything I can do to help other businesses avoid this nightmare, I'm happy to do. Well, and with that, that's uh, probably a very proper uh, note to close on. And I want to, of course, make mention of the fact that uh, for all of you that are listening in or if you're listening to this recording, um, the, there are some live links there for websites where you can contact Jeff, Diana, and Bob uh, if you have any uh, questions following uh, listening to this program. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to them with um, following questions and or comments. So uh, with that, uh, a very, very hearty thank you to all three of you for that excellent presentation. Um, I think not only was it um, uh, very informative for me and for those on the program now, but uh, we now have a recording of this in, in the IAPP online library. Uh, so if you're listening to this as a recording, I hope you're gaining uh, what you're looking for there. Uh, thank you for all of you that took the time to, uh, to listen in today. We appreciate having you on the line with us. And with that, I'd like to um, uh, move toward a close by asking you to uh, please provide us with some feedback here at the IAPP. There's a live link in front of you, and uh, that's a, it's a very quick uh, two-minute survey that we um, take very seriously. We look at and uh, we gain um, both your uh, input as to whether this uh, program provided what you were looking for when you signed up, and we also are seeking ideas for future topics that we might cover. And so if you have some ideas about some issues or topics you'd like us to cover on an IAPP web conference, please click that link and uh, take literally just two minutes to uh, fill out that survey for us and uh, provide us with that information. We'll do our best to uh, find some speakers to talk to the topic. A uh, reminder that if you are an IAPP um, certified privacy professional and uh, you would like to um, use uh, your participation in this program for uh, keeping your accreditation up, uh, this program is good for one CPE. And if you're the named registrant on the program, that's going to be granted to you automatically. You, you need to do nothing. Uh, but if you're listening in and you're not the named registrant and you'd like to receive that credit, that's also um, possible. And all you need to do is uh, hop on over to our website under the certification tab. Uh, there's a live link in front of you there to our website. And uh, we can, um, you can fill out an easy to um, fill out online form and receive that credit. If you're an attorney and you're hoping to get some uh, uh, continuing legal education credit for this, that, that uh, is very possible that you can. We do not pre-certify these programs, however. So if you're looking for CLEs for this program, um, feel free to submit your application in your jurisdiction. And if you need any supporting materials, uh, for instance, a um, copy of the slides and or um, speaker biographies, et cetera, I can uh, help you with uh, obtaining those supplementary materials. So uh, don't hesitate to contact me and um, I'd be more than happy to do what I can to help you there. Uh, lastly, as always, I'd love to hear from you. Um, my email address and phone number here at the IPP are up on the screen in front of you, and I uh, would love to have your feedback, uh, comments, and suggestions for future topics as well. If you want to just get in touch with me, that would be great. So with that, uh, I will one last time thank all of you for joining us today, and I will bring this program to a close. Thank you, and good day to all of you.